What's up, church? I'm so excited to be with you today as we wrap up. We are the church. Come on, can we just say that together? Here we go. We are the church. Man, it's been a great month talking about ecclesiology, the church, the study of the church, the theology of the church. And we've learned so much about what the scriptures teach us about church, how to rise above the identity crisis that the church has kind of gotten into, how to share Jesus with others. And really my prayer through all of this is that you would fall in love with the church because the church is the bride of Christ and to love Jesus is to love his bride. It says in Ephesians 5 that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without any spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. You know, Jesus died for his bride and Jesus loves his bride, the church. That's us. That should be all the motivation we need to be committed to the church and to serve the mission of the church. So today what I want to do is kind of wrap up with this picture. You ready? The church is God's team. The church is God's team. Come on, turn to your neighbor and just say, we're a team. That's right. The church is God's team. Listen to what Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. He says, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together. Listen to all the team language he uses. Standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. He says, don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they're going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved even by God himself. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. And then I love his closing statement. We are in this struggle together. That's part of what it means to live a life that honors God, to just live as a part of God's team, the church. We stand together. We're united in purpose as God's team. I think of so many great uh, examples of team from scripture. When Moses parts the Red Sea to defeat their enemies, he's holding up his arms in battle and he gets tired. So he is suddenly supported by the team, Aaron and her come over and help him hold his arms up and victory was achieved through the teamwork. I think of the story of the paralyzed man who wanted to get close to Jesus to be healed, but he's paralyzed. He can't do anything. So his friends, his team, they pick him up, they put him on a cot, they get him on the roof of the house that Jesus is preaching in. They, these guys are crazy. They li Don't you love it when your team's a little crazy? They dig a hole through the roof of the building and lower their friend down to see Jesus. And Jesus was moved by their collective faith. Not the faith of the individual, but by the faith of the team. And you may not remember, but the very first disciples Jesus ever called, he actually calls them as a team, not as individuals. Luke chapter 5 tells us that these guys had been fishing all night long and they catch nothing, which is bad because they're professional fishermen. So Jesus, he's been teaching, he sees them, he kind of yells at them from the shore. He's like, hey guys, try throwing your nets on the other side of the boat. And the guy that seems to be in charge, his name is Simon. You'll know him later in the scriptures as Peter. This guy's a professional fisherman. He basically gets in a little disagreement with Jesus that it's pointless to even try throwing the nets on the other side of the boat. But then he says this. He says, okay, Luke chapter five, at your word, I will let down the nets. And it says that when they'd done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, so large that their nets were breaking. And then I love this part, verse seven, they signaled to their partners in the other boat get over here. They signal to the team to come and help them. And the team comes and helps them and they fill both boats with so many fish that the boats start to sink. I was thinking about that story and how the nets start to break because the catch God wants to give is so great. Simon signals to the team, but only when the team works together to start untangling and mending the nets do they haul in all of the fish. You know, families, businesses, and yeah, even churches experience frustration because they get tangled up and they stop functioning as teams. When a team gets tangled up, there's no teamwork. 
You can have emotional tangles, relational tangles, spiritual tangles. These tangles prevent effective teamwork. You know, sometimes I'll take somebody to fish that's not very experienced and they're just constantly getting the line snagged, losing their bait, tangling their lines, and I end up spending most of my day not catching fish, but fixing their mess, getting their bait out of the weeds, right? Mending and untangling their lines. I'm trying to just do my thing, pilot the boat, bring in some fish, but they're constantly tangled, and they can't figure out how to get untangled. That's what happens in churches sometimes. People get tangled up by emotions, tangled up in these ideas, tangled up in past pains, all kinds of tangles and snags. And to be the church God has called us to be, we got to get all that stuff untangled. Now, I'm so grateful for our team of leaders here at Revolution Church and how hard they work to keep the team working and to keep all the nets untangled. So what does it mean to be God's team? It means we work together. It means we win together. It means we wage war together, and it means we worship together. Well, hey, my name is Adrian, and I lead everything that makes the church work. <laughs> yeah. Can you also tell that I've been fishing with Pastor Zach before? <laughs> um, we're going to continue to talk about God's team today, but we're going to do it through God's team. So we're actually going to bring up some of our leaders here, and we're going to finish the rest of this message today. And before we get started, on, the, on behalf of our leaders, I just want to take a second to honor Pastor Zach and Pastor Amber. It's, it's such an honor for us to lead under them and a privilege. We have some of the best pastors, and they're constantly going to battle for us. So let's give it up for them, church. Come on. All right, well, I'm going to kick it off talking about the church is a team that works together. So one of, the biblical or one of the biblical metaphors of a church is that it is God's family. We see this in Scripture in a couple places. In Ephesians 2, it says that we are members of God's household. In Romans 8, it says we are adopted into God's family. How many of you are happy that we're adopted into God's family, that we picked God's family, right? I know I am. I love my family, but I didn't get to pick them, right? <laughs> I actually grew up the youngest in our family of three children. And as we grew older, we were given responsibilities to take care of throughout our house. Some of y'all might know these as, char as chores. We call them responsibilities. And I love the word responsibilities because it taught us to be responsible as children. It taught us as teenagers to continue to be responsible. And now as adults, we're responsible adults. So as we came together and we all did our responsibilities throughout the week, we saw that it allowed some opportunities. It gave us more room to be a family, to go do things outside of the house. It allowed us more time with our friends. It also helped build trust with our parents, right? The leaders of our household. When I said, hey, mom, I want to go out and hang out with my friends, I said, yeah, I trust, I trust that you're going to make the right decisions because you've been doing your things around the house, right? So it, helped, it gave us some unique opportunities there. But it wasn't always like that, right? There were times where one of us didn't do our part, where somebody didn't pick up their weight and carry it. And it, what it did was it created tensions. It created frustrations, right, in the family. Frustrations from our parents, tensions between our brother and sisters, no fist fights, a little bit of tension. That's it. <laughs> um, but can I tell you today, church, that God's team is the same way. We all come together and we all have to contribute, right? God's team plays together. They, they, they participate together. So God's vision for the church is a collective effort. We all give back to God through the church. We give our time. We give the money that God has blessed us with. We give our energy and our spiritual gifts, right? In 1 Peter 4.10, it says, God has given each of you a gift of, great, of his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Then do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. It's so good. Whatever God has gifted you with, use it with all the strength and energy that you have to work together as God's team, as God's family, as the church, right? Yeah. Come on. Uh, you guys are starting to get fired up. We'll get there. <laughs> Think of all the leaders that we have here at Revolution Church from Celebrate Recovery. We have group leaders that happen throughout the week. We have our dream team, our overall dream team. We even have people sitting in the seats right now who are giving financially. And when we come together, we make a difference. It fires me up, church, when I'm walking through the lobby, 
this morning, actually. I'm walking through the lobby. I see Rev Kids serving on our hospitality team. I see our mixed youth serving with Rev Kids. I see our young adults up here leading worship. It fires me up, church. We're teaching them to, to contribute. We're teaching them to be a part of the church. They're responsible now. It's so good. And if, that's, if you're not on a team, can I encourage you today to go down to the hub after service and get plugged in? We got some dream team that are there waiting for you. They're going to help you get connected. We also have a little QR code on the seat back in front of you. Scan that QR code and sign up for that next starting point day. But don't just sign up. Show up. That's my challenge. Show up. Show up with an expectant heart that God is going to do something through you. He's going to do something with you. He's going to bless you, and he's going to bless many because you said, yes, I want to serve. So let me leave you with this. If you want to make a difference, get on a team and put in the work because God's team is a team that works together. Thank you. All right, church, can we give it up for Adrian just one more time? We're so thankful for all the teams that put in work here, our hospitality teams, our parking team, our safety team. We're so thankful for you guys. Thank you for what you do. Uh, my name is Emily, and I have the honor of leading our discipleship from the crib to the grave. So if you are a human, I probably lead something that you are a part of. Um, and today, I have the honor to talk to you guys about the church is a team that wins together. If you know me or have watched me or spent any time with me, it won't take you long to figure out that I am slightly competitive. Yeah. Do I have any other competitive people in the house? There you go. All five of you, you're my people. I like you. But one thing I have learned over the years is that winning teams have definitive wins. Every player knows what position they're playing and what that position does to help the team win. We're the church. The church has some definitive wins. Our wins are when we build God's kingdom one life at a time. Our wins is when we share the gospel as a church outside of these walls. Our win is every time someone goes down in that baptismal water. Our win is when we build disciples and we change lives. We know these wins. We love these wins. We get excited for these wins. But are we a part of the win? Do you see yourself as someone that's on the team? The world's going to teach us that the win is all just about me, that I need to be the one to catch the touchdown, that I need to be the one to take the shot from half court at the buzzer, that I need to be the one to score the goal. It's about me. We have Sports Center that shows plays of it. We have the Instagram that shows these clips, but we have to keep into perspective. That's a two and a half, or I'm sorry, that's a five to 10 second clip of a two and a half hour game, that there's a team that made those plays possible. So so church, what I want to tell you guys today is you're the team that makes it possible. Now we're blessed and we're honored with one of the best pastors there ever is, but he's not the only person that helps us win. We as the church have to help us win. And God gets this. That's why on his team, we play as a we. In Romans 12, 5, it says, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and each member belongs to the others. In Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10, it says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift the other up. But woe to him who is alone, for when he falls, he has no one. We are a community of we's. The world has it wrong. Now, I'm going to use some bad grammar here, because bad grammar just preaches a little better, but I'm not Pastor Zach, so please bear with me on saying this, okay, guys? We change the world when every me says me is a part of the we, and me wants what's best for the we, so me's going to show up and do what it takes for the we. So instead of me showing up to church and saying, well, who's going to greet me at the door? Who's going to make sure me parks close? Who's going to make sure me and my kids get taught about Jesus? Instead, when we understand this, we say, if we need someone to greet, then me will do it. If we need someone to think three generations and show up for these kids and these students, then me is going to do it. And if we need me to park far so a new me can come fall in love with Jesus today, then me is going to do it because it's not about me. It's about we. Y'all, I'm standing on this stage, a product of someone that understood that. Somebody showed up for me. Someone got that they are a part of the we, and they showed me my part that I played in the we. The church is a team that wins together. Church is the same, guys. Everybody contributes to the win. 
From the streets to the seats, it matters when we show up. But winning takes sacrifice. It takes hard work. It takes intentionally showing up. And we learn that from Jesus who paid the ultimate sacrifice for all of us. So I want to challenge us today, church. Do you know the part that your me plays in the we? And are you showing up? Because I don't know about you, but I want to win. Awesome. Give it up for Emily one more time. My dad said, if you want to be a winner, hang out with winners. Emily's a winner. Hey, my name is Sammy. I lead the safety ministry here. All right. A couple of you know about it. Good. Listen, serving as a soldier that, for my country, that has been an incredible honor for me. But serving as a soldier for the kingdom of God, mm, that's an honor like on a whole other level, right? You see, another metaphor for the church is the army of God, right? And that means what? That means that all of us, we're all holy warriors in this place. Look, whether you realize it or not, the church is a team. Everybody say team. team. That's right. And as a team, we wage war together. Everybody say together. Yes. That's right. How many times has Pastor Zach stood up here and talked about, we're not meant to do life alone. Yeah. We're not. That's just the reality of it. We're not. And wars are not fought by single individuals. Yeah. And the church, my friends, is at war. And it's a war that only the church can win. You see, not governments, not charities, corporations, None of them can wage this war. Only the church can wage this war. Because the church has very special spiritual weaponry that is needed to be able to wage this war. This is so important, guys, because life is not a playground. And in fact, it's a battleground. And as holy warriors together, we armor up and we go into battle together. 2 Corinthians 10 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Look at the person to your left and your right and say to them, I'm your battle buddy. I'm your battle buddy. To stand against our enemy, we've got to wage war together. Say together. Yes. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, mm, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Guys, there's a war in our country, in our cities, in our schools, in our classrooms. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. His strategy is to cut you off from friendly communication, isolate you, start to probe your defenses, looking for weaknesses, looking for vulnerabilities. And his aim is to what? His aim is to breach your defenses and steal, kill, and destroy all that is good. But we, we look to Jesus. We hold the line. Jesus has already won the war. So we stand in victory. And we hold the line. Say, hold the line. hold the line. We put on the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, right? These are from the Holy Spirit, right? And then we pick up the sword, the sword of the Spirit, baby. That's right. That's our offensive weapon. And we gather as God's army, as God's church, we armor up, we study God's word, we learn together. We come to church to be fed the word of God. For what? For the battle. Church, you and I together can in fact 
make the world around us a non-permissive environment for the enemy. Together, we hold the line. Thank you. Come on now. If you're not ready to go to battle after that, then I don't know. You might need to go back, get some coffee, and then come on back over, and uh, then we'll get after it, all right? Hey, thank you, Sammy. Thank you for all you do. And this incredible team, and these people right here, they love you. They work hard for you. They want to make sure you have a good environment. Our pastors love you. They work really hard for you. We get to see behind the scenes how much they care, how much they pray, um, how much they think about you every moment. And so can we give it up one more time for our pastors and our leaders in this place? Man. Well, my name is Mallory, and I get to lead everything creative, and I am very excited to bring you this message right now because Sammy got me so pumped that I'm ready. And so I'm going last today, but technically this is the very first thing that God asked us to do. So we're doing the very first last, but not necessarily the best for last, okay? So don't get that twisted. All right, so the very first purpose of the church is ministry unto God through worship. So the church is a team that worships together. One of our core values here at Revolution Church is we sing loud. Y'all know it's my favorite. It's my favorite one. Uh, We sing loud. Worship is adoration and it is reverence to God. And so we come into this place and we sing songs together. We go into battle together. There is something very special about coming in and worshiping our Savior as a group. And when we come in, this is our battle cry. This is, this is how we're going to war against the enemy is through worship to our king. And so maybe today it was a little bit tough to get in here. Like you were in your bed and it's like so comfy, one of those squishy ones like mine. And you're like, man, I don't know. I'm just going to you know, get back in here. Or maybe you've had a hard time in your life. You've been going through something. And it was just really tough to get in into this place, but you showed up, you put your hands up in worship, you said you were grateful for our Father, and there is victory in that when we come together and we worship. Now, we not only do this through songs, but God calls us to be worshipers. We are to live our life as worshipers to the King, and he talks about it in Romans 12. He says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. I love the way the message translation puts it. I think it just makes you have handles around what the scripture is saying. It says, so here's what I want you to do with God helping you. Take your every day, your ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and just place it before God as an offering. That is what he's asking us to do, to be worshipers. And so what does that mean practically? It means how we conduct ourselves, right? So when we go to work, how we're acting, right? Um, That's how we can be worshipers of Jesus. When we go to school and we don't like the teacher or the professor that much, but how we respond, right? This is how we conduct ourselves in a manner that's worshiping our Father. When we're driving, (laughs) all right, I see them revolution stickers all over 35. (laughs) Don't act like it's not you. Okay, I see it. Mm -hmm. I didn't put one on my car. So (laughs) when you're driving... (laughs) Hey, when you're, at, when you're at your kid's game and that ref makes that call that is not fair for your kid, I have seen some of y'all wilding out out there, okay, <laughs> competitive <laughs> over there. Hey, we, it's funny, but we understand, right? That is what we're called to do. It's in those moments that matter. It's in those moments that say, this is our God, our Savior. I am set apart. I will worship him in a different manner. And so that is what God calls us to do when we are to be worshipers. Now, we're in what we would call a corporate worship setting where we come together different from private. Your private worship is when you spend that alone time with the Father. You get in the Word. You listen to worship. You spend those intimate moments with our Father. This is a corporate worship. And I believe there's just something different that happens when we come together in these moments of corporate gathering. One thing, I think it makes a greater just consciousness of God's presence. When you walk through the doors and people are just all in one accord singing, come on my soul. There's just a presence and an anointing of the spirit that you do not find 
anywhere else except for in God's presence together as a team worshiping. My favorite thing is I believe it builds confidence to conquer. When we're singing, come on my soul, don't you get shy on me. I could run through a brick wall. Like I am ready to go. Ready. Y'all got me just acting a fool because I am so pumped because what I believe is that I can do it. With God, I can do it because I got a team of people who believe it. They believe what the Lord is saying. They're saying, oh yeah, don't you get shy on me. Look, we're about to, let's, let's go all out. That's my favorite thing. It builds a confidence to conquer. It also establishes a common ground for praise. So you can come into this physical building. You can lift your hands, say hallelujah. You can get crazy. You can love the Lord. You can worship him. If you do it at your cubicle, could get weird. I don't know. I'm not sure what your workplace is like. You do it at the library, you're getting kicked out, okay? Uh, so it really does. It, it's a common ground for us to come in. It is a place where we can come together and we can worship corporately. I believe something special happens in that environment. I believe you know it too. You can feel it in your soul. Now it's easy to come in for me when things are good and worship the king, right? Good hair day, let's go. Feeling good, hallelujah, the Lord provides, right? Got paid, yes sir, let's go. Come on, I'm feeling good. Thank you Jesus for all you've done, right? I don't know, single guy, you, maybe you asked that girl out, she said, yes, you're coming in a little bit more excited about worshiping today, right? Because he's provided for you. But man, what about when it's not like that? Because can we be honest that life can get tough and that it is not always like that? And we don't always walk in here feeling that way. Like Sammy said, the enemy's here to steal, kill, and destroy. He will do anything to keep you out of this place and lifting your hands to the Father. Because if he can keep you in that spot, then you're going to stay there stuck, right? And so when we come in, we're able to break change. So what happens when you come in and you don't feel like that? If I can be vulnerable with you for just a minute, there was a season of my life just a few years ago where I was in that. My dad was battling cancer. I remember coming in, sitting over here, worshiping, praising Jesus, believing with all faith that God would heal my father right here on this earth. I had a team of people praying. We were believing, he's young, we're going, God's gonna do it, he's gonna save him, he's gonna heal him. And when my dad passed away, I had a big choice to make. Because I had to, after the funeral, came back, came right back here, right back over there to that spot. And I mean, I was full on toddler in it, hands down, like, mm-mm, you ain't, mm-mm, not gonna do it, God. How could I possibly lift my hands and worship in a place where I believed that you would heal him and you didn't do what I asked? How could I worship a God like that? I was so broken. I knew I loved, I knew I loved God, but man, I was wrestling. It was hard. And I remember God in a firm but gentle voice, just, just like a father who loves you. He said, why did you worship me in the first place? Did you worship me because I always answer your prayers like some genie in a bottle? Or did you worship me because of what I have already done on a cross for you? How I sent my only son to die on a cross, how he saw me in my brokenness. He knew what my life would be like. He knew some of the choices that I would make would not be good, yet he chose to send him anyway. And in that moment, I felt the spirit like I have never felt before. I understood what a true worship meant. I understood that when I decided to stop throwing a fit, <laughs> that I didn't get exactly what I wanted, but that God knew what was good for me. God knew the plan the whole time. And I lifted my hands in worship. I looked the enemy square in the eye and said, my God is still good. This won't take me out. Come on, I got a story to tell. There's people who need to hear. Can you stand up to your feet today? Come on now. We are a church who worships together. Psalm 34, three says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Come on now, the people on the stage are not the worship leaders. We are the worship leaders. And I believe there's somebody in here today who has some dealings that you need to do with God, who might be holding their fist a little bit tight, who might be feeling like they don't wanna do it. Can I tell you that 